Well, the House has approved legislation today by voice vote that will allow families of victims of 9-11 to sue the government of Saudi Arabia. Now, this was a measure that was passed by the Senate in May. And, of course, the White House has expressed concern, opposition to this bill. It's now making its way to the president's desk. He has indicated that he is going to veto this. Um, earlier this year in April, President Obama talked about how uh, the consequences would be, for example, allowing people in other countries to sue the United States. He said if we open up the possibility uh, that individuals in the U.S. can start routinely suing other governments, well, then we're also opening up the U.S. be continually sued by individuals uh, in other countries. But, of course, this really isn't much of a concern to the president if you consider the fact that one of the most pr pressing issues with the Trans-Pacific Partnership is the fact that we're going to have these independent tribunals that can override the laws of sovereign nations, including the United States. Probably what the president is more so concerned with are these threats by Saudi Arabia uh, that they're going to have economic fallout if Congress dares pass this bill allowing uh, the families to sue the Saudi Arabian government after the declassification of the 28 pages showed ties linking to high-level Saudi officials. Um, back in April, they said that they were telling the Obama administration and members of Congress that it would sell off hundreds of billions of dollars worth of American assets held by the kingdom if they dared do this. Now, Hillary Clinton has indicated that she's going to be showing up to the memorial there on 9-11 there with the families, which, of course, is going to be a slap in the face to these families because not only was she part of the administration that stalled the declassification of the 28 pages because they didn't want to ruffle feathers uh, there with their Saudi Arabian allies, but, of course, uh, are these families going to ask Hillary Clinton to return the money that she continues to take from Saudi Arabia? They're helping to finance her campaign. Nobody wants you there. Now, of course, uh, uh, Julian Assange has come out and said that he has tens of thousands, possibly as many as 100,000 pages of documents of different types that are related to the operations of uh, Hillary Clinton and what she is associated with. And he said this is thanks in part to new sources who have stepped forward after the organization leaked internal emails from the DNC. Uh, he said in a radio interview with Sean Hannity that a lot of people were inspired by the impact. And so they've stepped forward with additional material. Very, very interesting. Uh, he says that he hopes to be able to release these new documents well before November. Donald Trump says Hillary Clinton is running a global enterprise and spreading terrorism. Hillary Clinton is trigger happy, totally trigger happy. She's raced to invade, intervene, and topple regimes. She believes in globalism, not Americanism. Her policies unleashed ISIS, spread terrorism, and put Iran on a path to nuclear weapons. During the same speech, Trump declared that the 9-11 terrorist attacks would have never happened on his watch, saying that bin Laden would have been caught long before the downing of the World Trade Center. And we all know that Donald Trump does not have the financial backing that Hillary Clinton does from the government of Saudi Arabia, who helped finance the 9-11 hijackers. This, according to the U.S. House Intelligence Committee's recent publication of the 28 pages. You can learn more right now at InfoWars. Well, a horrifying car crash happening to Russian President Vladimir Putin's chauffeur. This car crash happening in the official presidential car. We have a video footage of the scene of this. Um, earlier today, Alex discussed it on the show. Take a look. Vladimir Putin's favorite chauffeur killed in accident exactly as former CIA director described on TV on Charlie Rose. Mike Morell, former deputy director of the CIA, salivates over the idea of covertly killing Russians and Iranians. The full conversation aired on PBS on August 8th. This happens a month ago, and then a few weeks later, boom, the magic crash. There's a lot of speculation about who may have done this, but it looks like an assassination attempt on Vladimir Putin's life, possibly uh, in retaliation for the Ukraine. Could this be a Western source, something tied to Hillary, perhaps? You know, information is still unfolding.
But what we do know is this looks like a violent message sent to Putin regarding his favorite chauffeur and his death, or possibly an attempt on Putin's life himself. Now, the chauffeur had a premonition earlier last month saying that he knew that he could possibly die in this way. Just like Princess Diana, she had the same premonition 10 months before her death. She said, they're going to kill me. Here's how they're going to do it. 10 months later, she was dead in the exact way she knew she was going to die. It also sounds like the death of Michael Hastings, and uh, he had a premonition similar to this. He said, somebody's messed with my car. He actually went to a friend's house and begged to borrow the car the weekend before he died, saying that he thought that he was going to die in a similar way, and the chauffeur having the same premonition. Now, this crash, going back to it for a moment, it's not often that a head of state or a superpower nation is sent such a dramatic and violent message like this, and it appears uh, that uh, the killing of President Vladimir Putin's favorite chauffeur um, is perhaps sending a message directly to him. More information is still in Unfolding about this story. We'll keep you updated. I'm Margaret Hell reporting for Infowars.com. A drug company that makes the powerful painkiller fentanyl has given $500,000 to the campaign to keep marijuana illegal in Arizona. Now, this painkiller fentanyl is 50 times more potent than heroin. People are actually using it on the streets to cut it with heroin. Uh, but this is Insys Therapeutics. This is their sole product, fentanyl, and they give this money to Arizonans for responsible drug policy. Their donation was nearly four times more than the second largest of 110,000. But of course, now we have pro-legalization campaigners claiming that the drug companies want to keep cannabis illegal to corner the market for drugs that relieve pain and other symptoms. Absolutely they do. Um, now the company says, well, we are just donating here because this initiative fails to protect the safety of Arizona's citizens and particularly its children. Um, and it's also going on to say that the USDA hasn't approved marijuana for any medical use, but activists, of course, see this as a sinister ploy to maintain control over the drug market, of course. And then on the other hand here, we have the DEA planning to ban uh, Kratom, which I've never heard of this actually. Someone just put this on my desk. Um, but these are leaves. They're closely related in the makeup to the coffee plant. And the DEA is specifically looking to outlaw the compounds found in this herb. Now, advocates of these leaves argue that it doesn't make you high. It's rather a, an alternative to a traditional and addicting pharmaceutical pain relief. It's also being used to treat psychological disorders. And for those people coming off of opiates, it takes the edge off of excruciating withdrawal process. A lot of People, uh, advocates for Kratom are saying, this has helped my friends survive. They're not going back to these hard drugs, these prescription painkillers, the heroin. But now the DEA is wanting to make it a schedule one drug so you could be treated like as if you were uh, had heroin in your pocket for these leaves. And these are leaves that have been used by people in South Asia for hundreds of years. It helps alleviate pain. It's a plant. It's a natural herb. And people say that the chances of overdosing on this plant is extremely low, if not impossible, because your body forms a natural reaction of vomiting before you would ever be likely to consume too much. Now let's take into consideration that prescription drugs have killed so many people. The, 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 the deaths involving prescription opioids have quadrupled since 1999 along with the sales of those prescription drugs. So they're continuing to push more prescriptions as more people are dying. So today, at least half of all U.S. opioid overdose deaths involve a prescription opioid. In 2014, more than 14,000 people died from overdoses involving these prescription drugs. How many people have died from overdosing on Kratom? Zero. From overdosing on marijuana? Zero. But they do not want to allow people to have access to plants that help people deal with their pain in a natural way. They want to corner the market on this. So many risks involved with prescription painkillers, not to mention the fact that it can totally destroy families. If you want more information on this Kratom, there's actually going to be a March Stop the DEA on Tuesday, September 13th. You can go to KratomMarchDC.com. They're going to be taking a stand at the White House coming up next week. Ladies and gentlemen, North Korea has just executed another nuclear detonation test. Now, this is the fifth test in the last decade. Now, North Korea is celebrating this detonation right now. They're 
bragging about how this is their most powerful detonation yet. This detonation was equivalent to 10 kilotons of TNT. Their last detonation in January was equal to 6 kilotons of TNT. And if you look at the detonations that they have done in the last decade, you go back to October 8th, 2016, an earthquake, the magnitude of 4.3 was measured after their detonation. Then in 2009, it went up to 4.7. In 2013, it got up to 5.1. And now twice this year, in January, an earthquake with a magnitude of 5.1. And then yesterday, after their latest nuclear detonation, a magnitude of 5.3. So nuclear testing causing earthquakes in North Korea. Now, what is the response um, from world leaders? Well, right now, they're worried that North Korea is going to find a way to miniaturize a nuclear device and put it on a warhead. They're saying they've already mastered that capability. So that is what the world is worried about right now. So what are they saying? Global condemnation for North Korea's nuclear test, and now sanctions are being threatened. UN sanctions that were already tightened last March are now being thought about tightened again, where the 15-member body is considering punishing North Korea for this detonation. Obama said additional significant steps, including new sanctions, need to be levied on North Korea. U.S. Defense Secretary Ash Carter said it's China's responsibility and that China has and shares an important responsibility for this development and has an important responsibility to reverse it. That's funny. That echoes Donald Trump. I thought Donald Trump didn't know what he was talking about with foreign policy. Apparently, he was right on the target with that one. Of course, this is tough guy Obama. He also said that North Korea's tests demand serious consequences. He needs serious consequences on North Korea. This is the tough guy, Barack Obama. Now, he's also said in the past, this is nothing new from Obama. In the past, he said that America could destroy North Korea. He has said that their erratic and irresponsible behavior was going to face consequences. He said it earlier in April this year. What has he done? You can go back years and years and look at old stories of Barack Obama threatening North Korea after nuclear tests. He said it in 2010, folks. Obama tells military, this is from Reuters, prepare for North Korea aggression. He said that he is building up the U.S. military to ensure readiness to deter further aggression from North Korea. Now, this was in 2010, folks, okay? Now, do you think testing nuclear devices and then saying you have the capabilities to put it on a warhead, do you think that's furthering aggression? Do you think that tough guy Obama is going to do anything about this? I don't think so. And meanwhile, we're in this war on terror. You don't think Kim Jong-un is a terrorist? You don't think the people in North Korea are being oppressed? Why don't we ever do anything about Kim Jong-un and North Korea? Could it be there's no political leverage to be gained? What do you think, America? Do you think Barack Obama will do anything about North Korea's testing? Do you think UN will do anything about North Korea's testing? We'll find out. Stay tuned at Infowars.com. Ashley Beckford here, reporting for Infowars.com. I'm here to tell you about a disturbing new level that social justice warriors have gone to. It was linked on the Drudge Report today, College to Offer Social Justice Bachelor Degrees. From CampusReform.com. University of Iowa looking to create social justice bachelor's degree. The University of Iowa could become the first school in the state to add a bachelor's program in social justice to its list of degrees. 
The school already offers a first-year seminar on social justice, as well as a Justice for All living learning community where students can live and learn about systematic problems in our society. University officials told local newspaper that both programs have been so well received with full enrollment in the Justice for All learning community that demand for an actual degree program really makes sense. They're expecting 25 students in their first year and they have a target goal of 110 students by its seventh year. The school does not anticipate that the program will require any additional costs and it's going to be in the Department of Gender, Women's and Sexuality Studies. The social justice bachelor's degree is just another step in the trend of getting useless degrees. Now we know that most college graduates only end up with well high paying jobs if they end up graduating with a degree in STEM science, technology, engineering, and math. What type of society based its higher education in such useless and pointless kind of vocations? This is something that you don't actually need a degree for, and it's just a waste of time, in my opinion. Stay tuned for more special reports at InfoWars.com. Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. It is Friday, September 9th, 2016, and I'm Leanne McAdoo. Here's what's coming up tonight. Tonight, former director of the CIA, Mike Morrell, wants to kill Russians. To make the Russians pay a price. Killing Russians? Yes. And he told Charlie Rose that he'd also like to go after Syrian President Bashir al-Assad. I want to scare Assad. So I want to... I want to um, go after his presidential guard. I want to bomb his offices in the middle of the night. But it's best not to tell the American public. You don't tell the world about it, right? Meanwhile, Vladimir Putin's favorite chauffeur is mysteriously killed in a traffic accident. And the horrific scene is captured on video. All that plus much more up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. Joe Biggs here with InfoWars.com. Now today I'm going to be speaking with Ryan Fournier of Students for Trump. How are you doing today, Ryan? I'm doing great. How are you? Not too bad. Now briefly, tell me about yourself and how you're connected with Students for Trump. Well, uh, I go to Campbell University. I'm a sophomore. Uh, Students for Trump was created by myself and John Lambert in early October. Um, after attending a GOP event, uh, the event's basis was uh, one of the motivating factors was uh, getting young people involved in the political process and helping the older folks with social media, um, since that is one of the things that they need the most help with during a campaign. So I decided, you know, instead of helping out on a local level, why don't I do something on a national level? And there wasn't a student organization established yet for Donald Trump, so I decided why not? And I uh, started a Twitter account and it grew from there. So tell me briefly what Students for Trump is. What is it you're tr exactly trying to do, and how are you really involved with students across the country, and what are you doing to get them involved uh, in supporting Trump? Well, we, we do a lot of uh, campus initiatives, a lot of things where we go out on campuses. Um, we show the students how they can get involved with politics. And, and Donald Trump, you know, his policies are really understandable. You can understand them um, by watching some of his speeches or going to his rallies. Um, so we really want to get students involved, uh, go to rallies, uh, get out the vote, go door knocking, phone banking for the local campaigns. Um, the GOP has been a phenomenal help in getting some of our volunteers plugged in with the campaign. Uh, we just want to get young people involved in the political process. It's very important, um, even if you're not uh, looking to go into politics, it's very important to know what is going on around you in the government um, because it's one of the most important aspects of society. So we definitely try to get all the young uh, youthful people involved and, and get them out there and helping get Donald Trump elected. Now, roughly how many campuses across the country do you have students who are actively uh, supporting Students for Trump and uh, really, uh, you know, working with you guys and trying to get that word out? I would say a little bit over 100. Um, we, you know, we have a careful vetting process. We, we hire campus ambassadors. Uh, we put them through a screening process. We check their you know, backgrounds to see if they, you know, what they post on social media, if they truly support Donald Trump. Uh, and then we put them through and they become a campus ambassador with us. Um, the process has been going great. Um, they go out, they table. 
Um, they collect information data. Um, we put them on newsletters. We send them information on when they can participate in certain events. We send them information on rallies. Um, so that, that's some of the, just a little bit of what we do. So, so that's something you guys do. You're, you're posting where his rallies are, what the students can do to get involved, how they can go out in the community. Uh, what kind of things are you actually pushing out there? And what is it that these students at other campuses are receiving to get out there and help you guys? Well, we, a lot of our push is through social media. We get a lot of people involved with uh, social media. So whenever they go out and do events, we have them take photos and we show the world and, and really the country what uh, students are doing to help in this election. You know, students for Hillary, very small base of people. In fact, I think over the last six months of doing this, I've only met a handful of supporters who actually support Hillary Clinton that are students and they're out campaigning for her. So uh, we're very proud of that. And, and every month we have about three million impressions on social media. So we're definitely dominating social media. We were the third most influencer at the GOP convention among news networks. So um, we're very proud of that as well. So social media is our biggest way of reaching out to millennials across the country. Yeah, I saw your Twitter page uh, for the first time a couple weeks ago, added you guys, and you guys quickly responded, said that you were fans of InfoWars. And what I've noticed over the past few weeks is when you guys post stuff, I'm seeing people like Trump Jr., uh, Eric Trump, you know, his wives, other people within the Trump campaign who are liking and retweeting your posts. So how directly connected are you guys to the Trump campaign, and are they helping you guys get the word out to help uh, get that vote out to the younger millennials and the, the people in college? Most definitely. You know, the, the Trump family, they're, they're surrogates for the millennial movement. Um, we've worked with them on events. They've been traveling across the country, um, going to certain, you know, Trump campaign events and channeling the millennials. Um, and they retweet our stuff, and we're very grateful of it. It gets more views. It gets more people know of what we're doing and how the students are helping Mr. Trump get elected. Um, they've been phenomenal. We've been working with the campaign. Uh, we are a coalition. We're not official, but we have worked with the campaign in multiple different states. Um, and we, we know we've been grateful of all the support we've gotten so far and, and can't wait to see what's up in the next 60 or 59 days as it is now to Election Day. Now, if there's a student out there that's involved in another college campus that doesn't have a Students for Trump organization, what can they do to get a hold of you guys, go through that vetting process, and become uh, a surrogate for you guys as well? Well, they'd be able to go to students4number4trump.com, and they'd be able to become a campus ambassador on their campus. Um, and then what we do with that is, you know, we put them in the system. We get them to know of how we organize on campuses. It's fairly simple. Um, and then we connect them with the campaign in their states. It's very important that we, uh, and, you know, one of our, 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 our side mottos is that we, we feed the campaign with volunteers, youthful student volunteers. So um, we get the students to go out to the campaign, help them out on the call to action, which is a large call to action happening nationally with the Trump campaign this Saturday. Um, and that's what we're encouraging all of our students to go out and participate in. Um, is this call to action day where they'll door knock and phone bank for the whole day. Um, and it's paid for by the, the GOP and the state campaigns for the Trump campaign. Um, so that is what we're trying to do. But most likely, most definitely go to our website, sign up to be a campus ambassador. Um, and we'll get you plugged in. All right. So what are some of your plans for the upcoming debates and the rest of the election cycle, uh, getting people involved? Are you planning on attending any of these debates, the Trump versus Hillary uh, debates that might or might not happen actually one on one? You know, we saw the forum that happened the other day that was really lackluster. You had Matt Lauer, who was a. Uh, you know, used to be a member of the Clinton Global Initiative getting up there and really asking some bogus questions, trying to corner Trump. Are you guys planning on going to any of these events as this organization? And what other things do you have planned coming up this year? Well, we do have a couple students that are planning to going to the uh, Hofstra debate, which is the first one scheduled in New Jersey. Um, and we do have a lot of watch parties across the country. One of the things we love to do is get the students involved, get them together, get them bonding and, and you know, watching these debates and, and you know, communicating. Uh, That's one of the biggest important things about, you know, what we do is actually communicating the policies and understanding them. So when they're in the same room together watching these debates and the questions come up, they can ask each other. So we're going to be doing debate watch parties. We've got the campus initiatives, um, build a wall day, which was a really popular thing we did last year where students across the country, Washington State sprung a, a big leap on this. They built a wall on their campus um, to show support for building the uh, wall. Um, and then also the chalkening, which was something we coordinated as well uh, with Dan Scavino uh, earlier last, it was earlier this year actually. Um, and, you know, we're going to be working on doing something of that uh, again as well. But getting people involved is, is the big important part, and we're, we're trying to do it effortlessly every day.
Now, what's it like for you being a Trump supporter on a college campus? College campuses are now that are littered with social justice warriors and crazed left, you know, leftist communists that are all over the place. What's it like for you? What's your experience been thus far? Well, you know, Campbell University is the 25th most conservative school in the country, so I don't have really much of that to worry about, but I do have a lot of people that work with me. Um, you know, James Alsup, my uh, national senior advisor, he works with us, and uh, he's done a phenomenal job. But over at Washington State, um, you know, he's had a lot of this, you know, these incidents where people have, you know, attacked freedom of speech. They've tried to suppress it. When Milo attempted to, you know, come and visit Washington State, there was a big outcry. And the same thing with DePaul, um, you know, Nicole Bean's territory up there. Um, you know, there's just plenty of uh, opportunity for them to come in and step in and, and, and ruin events and, and ruin things. But, you know, we, we stand through it all and we, um, you know, we prevail in the end. Uh, freedom of speech is something that this country was built on and we're not going to stop just because somebody is upset about it. Um, and we're going to keep moving on. So, I mean, it has happened multiple occasions. I know UC Berkeley had happened yesterday. They tore up some Trump signs. Uh, but, you know, what I say about that is they can tear up our signs, but they can't take away our votes. Exactly. So is there anything else you'd like to add about what your organization has to offer? Uh, just any final words whatsoever? You know, check us out on social media and go follow us. You know, the Trump campaign is looking for plenty of volunteers. You know, the student coalition is looking for volunteers. And we need people to come out and help us. You know, we need students to get out there, motivate other students to get out to the polls and vote. Um, that's the biggest thing. So just go check out Students for Trump. Check out our social media. And uh, that's about it. But thanks, guys. All right. Well, thanks for being here, Ryan. This has been Joe Biggs with Infowars.com. Thank you, Joe. Well, it is now almost 15 years since the events of 9-11 that transformed the world, and we are still in pursuit of justice. Now, of course, this year is a little bit different. We're one step closer to the truth with the declassification of those 28 pages. Now, the annual symposium that's held in New York City, uh, sponsored by Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth, Lawyers Committee for 9-11 Inquiry, and other groups, they're going to be putting on a Justice in Focus symposium. It'll be held September 10th and 11th. Uh, and uh, one of our intrepid investigative journalists is going to be one of the keynote speakers, Wayne Madsen. He'll be talking about creating our enemies. So Wayne Madsen joins me now. Now, Wayne, I guess uh, this 28 pages is going to be a pretty hot topic there at this weekend's symposium. Yeah, they are, especially in uh, light of the fact that uh, the release of the 28 pages, uh, at least in a heavily redacted form, we didn't get all the information. Uh, help prod the House of Representatives today to uh, pass uh, unanimously the uh, the bill called JASTA, which will uh, allow uh, victims, the families of victims of 9-11, to sue the government of Saudi Arabia. Now, President Obama has already uh, stated that he intends to veto that legislation. Uh, but that, that and 28 pages and the just a unanimous vote in the House will uh, be obviously uh, items of huge discussion here for the next two days. Right, and it's um, obviously pretty symbolic that they passed this just days before September 11th, and then of course to see Obama say where he stands on the whole issue. Um, you know, talk a little bit about these threats made by Saudi Arabia that they, they uh, this was back in April, I guess, they were warning of economic fallout if Congress dared to pass this bill. They were threatening to sell off hundreds of billions of dollars worth of American assets held by the kingdom. In fact, if the families were allowed to pursue, um, just to, to pursue any kind of recourse payback for what happened. Well, I don't think the Saudis are too concerned. Uh, not only do they have uh, they have the uh, Obama threatened veto to protect them, uh, but also uh, we we see that every attempt uh, to get to the truth in 9/11 is met with uh, institutional resistance uh, from the Central Intelligence Agency, uh, from from the White House. Whether it was the Bush administration and now the Obama administration, I would think that Hillary Clinton. Uh, would be in lockstep, of course, with the uh, Obama administration on this issue. But it's quite clear that the Saudis uh, feel that they've got enough lobbying clout in Washington that this uh, threat of uh, suing them by the families. And I'll, I'll be seeing them uh, every year. I come uh, to one of these events in New York 
and you see the same families, none of them uh, have gotten any closure. And that's 15 years. I would also point out that Obama picked this week to appoint a Saudi connected, uh, uh, or to nominate a Saudi connected lawyer to be a member of the fed federal bench, uh, U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia. This Mr. Qureshi, uh, the issue isn't that he's the first Muslim American judge. Nobody really should care about that. If he's qualified, he's qualified. Harvard Law School. The issue is the law firm he's with, Latham and Watkins, has, is very influential in Saudi Arabia. They have a major office in Riyadh. They have another major office in Dubai. And, and Qureshi has also been part of uh, operations to uh, uh, allow, for example, there was a case here in New York where uh, uh, two uh, movie producers wanted to put um, uh, ads on uh, and, and Metropolitan Transit Authority trains and buses uh, advertising a movie, and the, the, the poster said the Muslims are coming. And uh, the MTA didn't think that was a good idea. It was Mr. Qureshi, who Obama has nominated for the federal bench in D.C., which the D.C. Uh, uh, court is like the stepping stone in many cases for Supreme Court cases. And uh, here we have uh, here we have Qureshi representing uh, the movie producers that wanted these posters uh, right. the, the Muslims are coming. And this this is all done on 9-11 week. Obama hasn't even given any indication he's going to be in New York uh, for mm. the official ceremony tomorrow. Right. And that's all just a continued slap in the face to the families there and to the American public who is just in, in search of truth after all of these years, uh, obviously pointing out that these uh, 28 pages have been held for 15 years because they didn't want to cause any friction between the U.S. and Saudi Arabia. And of course, Hillary Clinton is so proud that she's going to be showing up there this weekend. And I wonder, you know, if the families will get the opportunity to ask her if she is going to give back some of the, the campaign contributions the Saudi Arabians have made to her campaign. Now, I know that that's going to be a big issue there. A lot of keynote speakers are going to be talking about prosecuting 9-11. Of course, always the science comes up, the 28 pages. Uh, but you are going to be there to discuss the creating our enemies. So give us a little taste of what we can expect. Well, I'll be talking about uh, how this group, the Islamic State or ISIS or Daesh, uh, uh, came out of the remnants of Al Qaeda in Iraq. Remember, uh, Donald Trump was correct when he said there was no uh, Al Qaeda in Iraq uh, as long as Saddam Hussein was in charge. After we overthrew him, of course, we had Al Qaeda in Iraq, and then out of that, we got uh, the Islamic State. The, the leader of, uh, of Al Qaeda in Iraq, uh, and then the first leader of Al Qaeda in Iraq, who then became uh, sort of the transition guy to, for ISIS, uh, we had Zarqawi, uh, Al Qaeda in Iraq, then we had uh, al Baghdadi, number one, the transition guy from Al Qaeda in Iraq to the Islamic State, and then we had Baghdadi, number two, the current caliph of the Islamic State. Um, there's information from intelligence services from inside Al-Qaeda itself that these were manufactured individuals. None of these guys ever existed. They were created as U.S. military psyops uh, to basically justify uh, interventions by the U.S. in first Iraq and then in Syria. What do you think is the key takeaway uh, in this you know, little bit of time we have left that you want people to remember about 9-11 and continue pushing, asking questions? Well, I like people to remember how their world changed on 9-11, uh, how for the last 15 years uh, we've lived in a, a different country, a very draconian United States. Um, you know, everything we do, traveling, uh, communicating with people, is all... Uh, the, the surveillance aspect of all this is, is a direct result of 9-11, and we should remember that those who were the real architects of this, the Project for the New American Century, urged the, the need for a new Pearl Harbor, and on 9-11 they got one, and, and we've seen what they did with it. Uh, they didn't make a secret of their intentions, and we shouldn't make a secret of them either when we look back to see uh, how, how this whole operation was pulled off and why it was pulled off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and of course, one of those things that I'm always so curious about is how it went from Osama bin Laden uh, to Iraq and then going to war in Iraq and taking out Saddam Hussein. Was this, um, you know, do you think this was the Saudis wanted him taken out? And the Saudis wanted him out. Uh, Cheney wanted the access to the oil. Uh, he wanted him out. Uh, 
And, and once uh, once they, the Saudis and the others, the Wahhabis, the Wahhabis saw uh, Saddam go, then they, they started to bear their fangs for Gaddafi uh, in Libya and Assad in Syria and Saleh in Yemen. And that's exactly what Hillary Clinton gave them. Right. It's just so incredible all these years later. And of course, the truth is starting to trickle out. People are waking up. They're wising up, of course, with the wonderful investigative uh, journalism coming from you, Wayne Madsen and, and others. Um, so this is just incredible, but really unbelievable that we're actually on the precipice of potentially electing this woman to become the president of the United States. And she and others have not been held accountable for this atrocious crime that has transformed the world. Well, that's correct. And I mean, it, if we remember the first World Trade Center attack in 93, that happened on her husband's watch. And uh, it, it, obviously nothing was done to prevent another uh, other major terrorist attacks, as we saw uh, on 9-11. We already had a taste of it uh, in 1993 with the attempt to bring the towers down with a, a car bomb van uh, parked in the uh, underground parking garage base, basement of the World Trade Center. Right. And uh, Hillary Clinton's already telling us that this is going to be the new normal here. Wayne Madsen, thank you so much. We'll be checking in uh, at the weekend symposium there, seeking justice for the crimes of 9-11. So the Justice in Focus Symposium will be held September 10th through 11th. You can go for tickets and information at justiceinfocus.org. If you're in the New York area, be sure and show up. The entire event will also be streamed live on YouTube for the entirety of the weekend. That's at justiceinfocus.org. David Knight with Joe Biggs. We have the largest gathering, it's been estimated, of Native Americans in over a century. What are they gathering for? Well, you may have seen the news last week. There was a flashpoint and a struggle over a North Dakota pipeline. And it looks like this is going to erupt again. We have updating news about a new court ruling because it's not just a standoff. It's also a legal fight there. This is something that involves politics, it involves the environment, it involves economics, and it involves property rights. All of these things are involved in this struggle. What is going on here? Well, first of all, this is in North Dakota. This is oil that is coming from the Bakken oil fields. This is a very large, recently uh, exploited, discovered uh, oil field. This is the heart, uh, the area that is behind both the efforts to create the Keystone Pipeline, which has been uh, talked about for a number of years. I'm going to compare this uh, to that project. Uh, but it's also something that has been at the heart of an environmental issue. How do you get this out of there? Or should you? As a matter of fact, as The Hill points out, this is a new flashpoint for the anti-fossil fuel movement. But also it includes tribal heritage issues. I would say that the tribal heritage issues are a tactic to stop the larger, uh, to, to support the larger movement against fossil fuel. But when we look at transporting this oil, if that's what we're going to do, there's a couple ways that you can do this, of course, right? Actually, three, you can take it by overland, by rail. And this is particularly dangerous to transport this type of crude. As they were talking back in uh, 2014, Bloomberg pointed out at the time, they had just had a massive explosion that had killed 47 people when a rail car transporting this crude crashed. It's more volatile than other crude oil that has been uh, transported. They've also had situations where there were spills. They had 20,000 barrels were spilt out of a pipeline in a leak. So there's issues on both sides. However, when you look at an oil pipeline leak of 20,000 uh, barrels, that is minuscule compared to something like the Exxon Valdez, where you're transporting oil by a tanker over water. That was catastrophic at the time. That was 1,500 times bigger than the biggest uh, leak that they'd had at that point in time. So there's a couple of technological environmental issues here. Uh, also, we're going to take a look at who's involved. We have the left has taken up this cause. As I pointed out, it is really part of the anti-fossil fuel movement. But to bring us up to date on what's going on is uh, Joe Biggs. Uh, Joe, tell us a little bit about what happened last week, what your sources in the area have told you about the uh, confrontation last Saturday and what they are uh, worried about coming up this weekend. Well, what I saw for the first time was last Saturday, I had a friend who's a ranger send me a video. He goes, have you seen this? I think this is going to be the biggest story coming up. And it's a Democracy Now! video, which shows uh, the Native Americans, protesters out there, somewhat standing off with these contractors who are there protecting the pipeline workers for the North Dakota pipeline. And the way it's been edited, it looks like that 
these they have these big massives and they're attacking and biting people unprovoked and there's this chaos and these Native Americans are really just being treated like garbage and this big oil is coming through and they're taking their land and all that. Well, I've actually got someone on the ground, a source who's there right now. He called me earlier today and uh, has some information that really shakes things up, the narrative that's out there right now. Now he says actors or agitators have essentially moved in with the Native Americans and they're BLM agitators. Now we've seen in Ferguson with the hands up don't shoot narrative that was false, proven that way in court that the hands were not up, that Michael Brown uh, attacked Officer Darren Wilson and was shot after that. But still that narrative continued to move from Ferguson to Baltimore, so forth and so on. And when these BLM Funded protesters- Funded by Soros. And exactly. Yeah. And when these BLM protesters go and insert themselves into these situations, we see chaos break out. We see something that is big, but turns into a social justice you know, thing that shouldn't be. And it's taking points away from what you've brought up, taking away from the facts of what's really going on and trying to tug at your heartstrings to make you see these videos that they're carefully editing to make it seem a way that it's not really. Now, what I know right now is out there on the ground, no media is allowed that isn't vetted. So the Native American side, the BLM agitators that are there are only allowing certain media to come out there and cover this. And there are sub camps within camps, housing militant groups from what I've been told by my guy on the ground. And they're saying there's social media silence. They're doing OPSEC, operational security, where they go around day to day and they make sure people understand that, hey, don't post something until we have a chance to look at it because they're trying to push a certain narrative out there. They want the outside. People aren't able to go out there to North Dakota and find out what's going on for themselves. They want to be able to control what it is they want you to see. I remember when I first heard about this about 10 days ago, first thing I heard was uh, they're going through Indian lands mm -hmm. and they just cut off the water to the Indians. And it's like, what's going on? Well, first of all, you find out that A, it's not going through the Indian lands, and B, the water that they cut off was water that was being provided by the government to people who were camping out and protesting. So they went out in the middle of nowhere and the government was providing them water and finally the government said, you know, we're not going to provide this for you anymore. But it, it made it sound like they had cut off the, the water to the Indian reservation or yes. something like that. Well, there's a video that's pretty much gone viral. Democracy Now! seems to be the only media source that's really been vetted and allowed to go out there and cover this. And there's a video that's you know out there, shows this dog bleeding, and then it cuts to the Native Americans that have bite marks, and it goes, oh my God, these giant massives that these security guys, these contractors have, are going out and attacking these protesters unprovoked, and it's just horrible. Well, the truth is, there's three dogs in the hospital. The video that you saw of a dog with blood coming from its mouth actually had just been beaten with bats. Now, this dog was by itself, it was unprovoked, and these protesters came out there and beat this dog to a point that it has a concussion and other dogs are seeking help right now. Yeah. So that's that's pretty messed up within itself. Protesters attacked. Yeah, there were four private security guards, two guard dogs uh, injured and treated. Uh, the mm -hmm. tribal spokesman say six people, including a child, were bitten by the dogs. 30 people were pepper sprayed. Uh, there were, what, there was over 100 people that were um, over the line into the- 300 uh, protesters versus 20 security guards. Yeah, yeah. Now, like you said, these dogs did end up biting people, but that was only after they were provoked. Mm -hmm. You know, you beat a dog, mm -hmm. they're, they're, it's their natural instinct to try to survive. Mm -hmm. And when they've just been bloodied, beaten, and they don't know what's going on, I'm sorry, I feel bad for the dog, that's horrible. Now, now, this is also the uh, bulldozer and Jill Stein, they say, has a warrant out for her arrest because mm -hmm. she spray painted something on the bulldozer. This was in an area that had not been designated. As a matter of fact, the North Dakota archaeologist said this had not been designated as tribal lands, as uh, something that had Indian relics on it in the past. Uh, these people went over a fence, attacked this area that mm -hmm. was private property. And uh, now they have stopped this. They've gotten what they wanted, which is to stop it for at least a week. And uh, they're going to evaluate this and see if they can find any Indian relics on the ground, which they probably were. You can pretty much find an Indian arrowhead anywhere that you want. Uh, if they do that and they're successful in stopping it, that's the key strategy that they're trying to do. If they're trying today to get an injunction to stop the pipeline completely, they lost. The judge said, no, we have vetted this. We've had the Army Corps of Engineers look at this, do environmental studies, so forth and so on. It's going to continue that, of course, will be appealed. But if they can delay this sufficiently, then they will be able to shut the pipeline down because these people have to do something that, that makes economic sense. So if it gets delayed indefinitely, then their funding could dry up on this. So and it is going to be delayed for at least a week while they now look for Indian relics.
And what was it they were saying? They were saying that they didn't want that pipeline because they thought it was going to leak and poison the lake, the water, yeah. right? Yeah. So this leads me into my next point. Now, actually, the National Guard has been activated. They are on standby. And right now, with this whole thing coming out now, saying that the, the district court allowing them to continue on, uh, the security guards are ramping up their security now. They're kind of in a panic because they've been getting beat down, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a lot lately. Uh, the protest is actually is happening is happening on the Army Corps of Engineering land. Yeah. So these guys are in their tribal area. They hopped over a fence and went into other property, and that's where these clashes are actually taking place. Now, this is some information I got as well from my source on the inside. The oil company met up with the tribe and offered them $56 million hmm. to go through. And this was not through the middle of their land to split it up, because, you know, that mm -hmm. really screws it up. Mm -hmm. It pretty much takes away. I mean, it's just pretty much gone at that point in time. Mm -hmm. But this was on the edge of the land. Mm -hmm. And what happened was, is the tribal members decided, you know what? We're going to extort the oil company. We want to ask for more money. Mm -hmm. And this is the word I'm getting. I'm not saying this is, you know, written in stone, but the information I got from my source, they said that the tribe tried to extort the company, get more money out of them. And the oil company said, you know what? Screw this. Let's just move the pipeline over. So they moved away from trying to go over their land, moved it back on to the Army Corps of Engineer land, and then continued going through that way. Mm -hmm. And that is what started the protests. Once they found that they couldn't get their money, they weren't able to get more than what they wanted. That's when the protests became violent. We're out of time for the nightly news, but we're not out of information. There's a lot more information about this. If you want to see the rest of the report, you can go to the Alex Jones YouTube channel. That's it for tonight's nightly news. Join us again on Monday for the InfoWars Nightly News, 7 Central, 8 p.m. Eastern.